Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Black Panther opened the MCU to powerful themes and beautiful world building with a broader spectrum of colors. As I've been re-watching the Infinity Saga, I found a ton of new visual details hidden throughout Black Panther that we overlooked in past reviews. So let's take another look and break everything down scene by scene. The film opens with the history of Wakanda, which Oscar-winning production designer Hannah Beachler displays via grains of vibranium, like a father molding these figures from vibranium and rich soil with his hands. This is actually the same medium modern Wakandans use to tell their stories to each other. And it all stems from this ancient vibranium meteorite, the big what if that kicked off Black Panther's Afrofuturist alternate history. The use of monochromatic grains reflects the universality of the story. Director Ryan Coogler sneaks in this idea with the opening words. Baba? Yes, my son? Tell me a story. <laughs> Which one? The story of home. Now, the script labels these voices as an anonymous father and son, but those voices are those of Sterling K. Brown and Seth Carr, Njobu and his son Njajaka, future Killmonger, the forgotten sons of Wakanda maintaining the legacy of their true ancestral roots. So this story is as much Killmonger's as it is T'Challa's, a debate between ideals. How do we right the wrongs of history? Aggressive revolution or patient outreach? This forgiveness versus revenge conflict was modeled on the debate between civil rights leaders. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr and Malcolm X. As Spike Lee observed by including quotes from both of those men in Do the Right Thing, both of these approaches are worthy of consideration. Like all the titles in this movie, Oakland begins in Wakandan and translates to English. The film as a whole translates the story of Wakanda to something we understand, and they base the Wakandan written alphabet on Nsbidi, an ancient cuneiform from Nigeria. T'Chaka explains Ulysses Claw's stolen vibranium in Age of Ultron was actually made possible by Njobu, information leaked to him by Zuri for his Whitaker's younger self played by Denzel Whitaker. He convincingly poses as non-Wakandan, faking ignorance over kneeling. I also like how he and Njobu wear purple and black here, their home colors. In the present day, as T'Challa drops from the ship, he folds his arms in the Wakandan salute. Googler said that they got this salute from Egyptian pharaohs and ancient West African sculptures, and the fact that it translates to hug or love in American Sign Language. Googler shows these militants with an unbroken long take, something he does over and over again throughout the film, to convey a scene's geography, so that after getting a lay of the land, when he later intercuts with rapid fire action, we don't get disoriented. T'Challa, Nakia, and Okoye are color coded in black, green, and red here. Oscar winning costume designer Ruth E. Carter made them reflect the colors of the Pan African flag, so that when the trio fights together in battle, they represent all corners of the continent. When they return to Wakanda, the facade is projected with these hexagonal tiles, which recur on Shuri's 3D mapping of the car and in her lab. But balancing this advanced tech are traditional African architecture on the buildings, like those rondevels on the rooftops. It's another example of this idea of Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism is a concept embraced by the later Black Panther comics, the ones authored by ta Coates. It's a blending of racial themes and sci-fi to imagine an idealized advanced future that still embraces pieces of present day culture. And for the the moment we arrive in this setting, Kugler gives us a little hint of the magnetic train that runs throughout the city, and we keep seeing this train over and over again. It's all to set up the final fight as a return to a familiar battlefield. Queen Ramonda's dress was designed to resemble a setting sun behind her for the sun setting on her marriage, as she is in mourning here. Meanwhile, her crown was designed to stand tall from every angle, north, east, south, and west, for all tribes of Wakanda to see. Shuri teases about his suit. Just because something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. A little hint of the deeper theme of this movie that just because a system works for some doesn't mean we shouldn't work to improve it toward perfection for all. When Shuri flips him off behind Ramona's back, T'Challa's mouth drops. And that is how Ramona knows what Shuri did so that she could scold her. Like her all-facing crown, the queen has eyes everywhere, but really, it's because she knows her children so well. Like any great queen knows all of her people. We meet adult Eric Killmonger as he steals vibranium and this mask. You're not telling me that's vibranium too, huh? No, I'm just feeling it. He's remembering the moment he, as a kid, looked up at the Wakandan ship in Oakland. That royal ship is designed to look like an African mask from below, so that commoners looking up at it will be inspired with pride for their homeland. Killmonger wears a similar mask in the comics, but here, it's a symbolic claim of his royal place. At Warrior Falls, the tribes are color-coded and inspired by real African tribes. The Border Tribe in blue are based on farmers in Lesotho who wear similar blankets. The River Tribe wears green and uses shells in their designs. Isaac Debankale plays their 
leader, and his lip disc is a practice by the Mercy tribe of Ethiopia. The mining tribe wears red based on the Himba tribe of Namibia, known for treating their hair with red clay like this. The merchant tribe wears white with fancier finery, and the royals wear black and purple, reflecting the black vibranium grains and the purple heart-shaped herb, the two sources of their power. Zuri welcomes him. Prince T'Challa, the black Panther. Now, the Black Panther prelude comic confirms that T'Challa has carried the Black Panther role as his father's champion for nearly a decade at this point. So King isn't the same thing as Black Panther. So he's already Black Panther. This trial here is to legitimize his succession to the throne. Each tribe announces their support, including the River Tribe. Ibambe! The River Tribe will not challenge today. Ibambe comes from the Wakandan spoken language of Hosa, a South African dialect spoken by Nelson Mandela. And Yibambe means to hold or hold fast, depending on how you derive it. And it should sound familiar because T'Challa later uses it as his battle cry in Infinity War. Yibambe! 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 So this reframes that moment as a salute to his love. M'Baku arrives with the Jabari Mountain Tribe. Their iconography is the ape for M'Baku comics origin as the cannibalistic man ape, something they change for this movie and they joke about later. One more word and I will feed you to my children. I'm kidding, we are vegetarians. Here he says, Glory to Hanuman. Now the others worship the panther goddess Bast. Hanuman is the monkey deity from Hindu and various other religions. Small detail, I love how Winston Duke commits to the authentic pronunciation, putting his full chest and shoulders in the mm of his name. I, M'Baku. M'Baku briefly gets the upper hand in the duel and T'Challa sees his mother upside down. <laughs> Googler actually uses the same framing on the throne later when Killmonger usurps it. The overturning of T'Challa's kingdom is a fleeting fear right now, but Killmonger makes it reality in the second half of the film. So T'Challa spares M'Baku as they're both on the edge of the falls, a critical move that ends up saving T'Challa, giving him an alliance that helps him revert and restore his throne by the end of the film. T'Challa visits his ancestors in the ancestral plane based on Dejali in the comics, and his father T'Chaka advises him, and it's hard for a good man to be king. It's a warning for T'Challa's struggles to govern, but also to protect his rule from less noble men. In the streets of Wakanda, a new detail I spotted behind Akia and T'Challa, there's a starstruck local who uses her Kamoyo beads to snap a photo of the king. Now, I love this throne room. It's set on a leveled piece of rock from the mountain below, so that these leaders now sit and deliberate on the same surface that their ancestors did before this building was built up around it. But if you look closely at that throne, the vibranium has these crosshatch streaks in it. These are Widmanstatin patterns, and they appear from the cooling of the iron nickel alloy that's found in meteorites, suggesting that this throne was carved directly from unrefined meteorite ore. And this whole from the ground up design is also reflected in Shuri's lab with its spiral staircase shaped like a giant drill going into the rock. The sneakers that Shuri gives them have these Wakandan lettering on them and they translate to air and T'Chaka. T'Challa being T'Chaka's heir, but also it's a pun calling these the Wakandan Air Jordans since they were inspired by the American movie Baba used to watch, referring to the self-tying shoes from Back to the Future Part 2. And she gives T'Challa options for a new suit dispatching necklace. To the golden one, he says, Tempting. But the idea is to not be noticed. This golden necklace is the one that Killmonger later takes, producing a helmet with gnashing teeth and jaws, reflecting Killmonger's whole aim to show off Wakandan might versus T'Challa's quiet nature, though he remains tempted to lash out with that kind of revenge against Killmonger on behalf of Wakabi. The glowing stored energy in the suit lights up more Wakandan lettering on the abdomen that translates to I love you mom. So this tech salutes both their father and their mother. Look at the answers to these mysteries feel just out of your reach. Imagine if the content you normally consume on the internet actually was being blocked from your reach, even if you're paying to be a subscriber or something, but you just happen to live in the wrong country, or if you're worried about hackers or scammers stealing your information. There's all kinds of things to worry about these days. Well, ExpressVPN is your solution. Thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that encrypts your data to keep it from being stolen or tracked and can grant you access to blocked content. Many websites and services are blocked in different parts of the world, and some countries censor websites and don't let you surf freely. Like Netflix in the UK has content that US Netflix doesn't have, and vice versa. There are countries that won't even let you use Netflix. Can you imagine? And some things are more expensive online depending on where you live, like airline tickets, an industry that has no business raising prices on us right now. You're finally at our mercy. ExpressVPN allows you to reroute your connection to a server in a country of your choice, making those geo restrictions a thing of the past. ExpressVPN is also helpful for 
preventing your online data from being stolen or monitored without your knowledge. ExpressVPN servers operate at the fastest speeds. They have 24-7 customer support, and it's super easy to use. Just fire up the app and connect with just one click. It's the top-rated VPN provider, rated number one by TechRadar, CNET, and many more. Find out how you can get three months free by clicking on the link in the description box below. ExpressVPN.com slash new rockstars. Again, that's ExpressVPN.com slash new rockstars. In Busan, Bilbo meets Gollum. You got a mixtape coming out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually there is one. Yeah, I'll send you the SoundCloud link if you like. Claw's audio interests are a nod to his new sonic cannon replacing the arm that Ultron cut off. It's a slightly more practical version of his comics abilities that have like a, a satellite dish style arm cannon, but also he like can turn into sonic energy himself. And Stan Lee cameos here. In the credits, he's credited as Thirsty Gambler. After complaining about wearing a wig earlier, Okoye now weaponizes it along with her purse. And down on the floor, Nakia also weaponizes her femininity using her heel to beat a guy. And she'll spend the rest of the sequence barefoot. When Claw dismantles Nakia and Okoye's car in the background behind Ross after he picks him up. That loose tire just keeps rolling and rolling. And when Claw fires at T'Challa, T'Challa's suit briefly peels back, readjusting. Later, Shuri explains that the Wakandan mining trains... Sonic stabilizers. Sonic what? In its raw form, vibranium is too dangerous to be transported at that speed, so I, I developed a way to temporarily deactivate it explaining how T'Challa knew sonic energy would deactivate his and Killmonger's suits in the final fight. Killmonger bears out Claw. When he shows up around his neck, his Wakandan ring is visible. Now, we saw a similar ring in Civil War. It's a little clue here for his real identity, which we're about to learn. And later, when he usurps the throne, that ring moves from the necklace to his right hand. T'Challa pulls a cap and jumps on the grenade, and that blast charges up his suit with a purple glow, which gets brighter and brighter with each of Killmonger's shots, until the final blast throws him back against the wall, where that purple shockwave is dispersed. Back in Wakanda, Shuri says, Great, another broken white boy for us to fix. Referring, of course, to Bucky from that Civil War post credit scene and this movie's post credit scene where Bucky is mid-recovery and is now nicknamed the White Wolf, a nod to Hunter in the comics. Killmonger shoots through his girlfriend, Linda, shutting off all ties to his American identity before returning to his homeland. But earlier, Linda's name tag in the museum read Tilda, and that's because she was originally going to be Tilda Johnson Nightshade, but Marvel TV cast Gabrielle Dennis as Tilda Johnson in Luke Cage on Netflix. So here, she was renamed Linda and her role was reduced. And in the shootout, Claw actually had a kill shot first, but that bullet ricocheted off Killmonger's chest armor, sparing him and allowing him to get the drop on Claw. Zuri reveals the truth about T'Chaka and N'Jobu's political ties. The leaders have been assassinated. Communities flooded with drugs and weapons. They are overly policed and incarcerated. Here, right at the midpoint of the movie, Kugler reframes Killmonger's goals as somewhat justified, challenging the hero to consider that vengeance, in some cases, might be emotionally justified. When the two meet, T'Challa tells him, the Only reason I don't kill you where you stand is because I know who you are. He thinks he's showing mercy, but he just gave Killmonger everything he needs in this royal dispute. Because since T'Challa knows Killmonger's kinship, Killmonger knows that he has to to honor his claim to this speedy trial. T'Challa has removed his own ability to possibly delay things with an investigation. And when Killmonger declares his identity, the music track underneath is King's Dead. It's a signal of this changing of power, as well as the overthrowing of T'Challa's MLK-inspired values. At Warrior Falls, Killmonger breaks his spear to make it better for stabbing, which is actually a tactic from legendary African warrior Shaka Zulu, who is famous for evolving past spears to give himself a tactical advantage over other tribes. And each time he cuts T'Challa with this, Oscar-winning composer Ludwig Göransson mixes in a blow of the Fula flute. This is the instrument he uses to identify Killmonger throughout the film, as opposed to the talking drum for T'Challa. The talking drum beats like crazy in the first half of this fight, but it goes silent in the second half, right as Killmonger overtakes him. Killmonger tosses T'Challa over the falls, as he does in the comics, and Killmonger's meditation shows his younger self cradling his father, the same pose that T'Challa made when he cradled his dead father at the UN. Two young Wakandans, two parallel stories. Njobu's diary includes entries in Wakandan with an alphabet key explaining how Killmonger learned the language. There's also a map to Wakanda with coordinates. Now, if you put these actual numbers into Google Earth, they take you to the northeastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo near the Ugandan border. Almost exactly the world map marker from Wakanda's first MCU shout out in Iron Man 2. Killmonger burns the heart-shaped herb garden, showing its true agenda, not to preserve Wakanda or make it better, but to strip it of its uniqueness to make it like the rest of the world and the rest of the world like Wakanda. 
Ramonda Shuri and Nakia flee to M'Baku, his throne room is lined with these birch trunks, and they were chosen because birch grows in northern climates, and they're in the mountains here. Also notice how it's sharpened to intimidate the visitors. T'Challa is resurrected, and he confronts his father about his abandonment of his nephew. He was the truth I chose to omit. We're back to the debate over how to settle the sins of history. However it's addressed, it cannot go ignored. Like Langston Hughes' dream deferred, it festers like a sore, or it sags like a heavy load, or even, in some cases, explodes, as it did with their forgotten kin. Killmonger makes his attack plan. But the war dogs in London, New York, and Hong Kong are standing by. New York, Hong Kong, and London are the three power centers with sanctums. Killmonger's attack would have come at a very inconvenient time for the sorcerers, who actually came under assault just a few months after this in the MCU chronology, technically. Down on the train tracks, the two fight T'Challa claws to swing around. There's a move that's a bit similar to Wolverine's claw and to swing around in the Statue of Liberty and X-Men. T'Challa ends up defeating Killmonger by using his knowledge about the magnetic train tracks, giving him just enough of a window to stab Killmonger with the same Shaka Zulu spearhead that Killmonger created before. Hell of a move. Yeah, this is a total home field advantage. It's a trick that Killmonger couldn't possibly see coming because he was robbed of his opportunity to grow up in this homeland. So, as T'Challa did with Zemo in Civil War, he lets forgiveness prevail and allows Killmonger a chance to see the Wakandan sunset that his father used to tell him about in bedtime stories. Earlier, Killmonger promised, The sun will never set on the Wakandan Empire. Here, the sun sets on his dreams, and the strings of Gurenson's ancestral plane theme return here. <sighs> signaling Killmonger's union with his ancestors in this moment. When T'Challa learned the truth earlier, he was most disgusted with his father's actions with his brother. I didn't even give him a proper burial. So he does his best to do that for his cousin here, but Killmonger stays true to himself. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships, because they knew death was better than bondage. Those chilling final words stay with T'Challa. The final minutes reveal that he opens his council to the Jabari tribe, M'Baku has joined the chat, and the movie's original final scene, which was shifted to the post credit scene, shows T'Challa speaking to the UN. The wise build bridges, while the foolish build barriers. Similar to the advanced aliens, the Asgardians building their Bifrost Bridge to share their protection to other peoples, Wakanda now opens its doors. Even when, as we'll see in Infinity War, that will cost them a lot. Kugler instead made this movie's final scene more personal, a return to his hometown of Oakland, where the old makeshift hoop out of the crate has been improved with a real one, as T'Challa plans to enrich this community with an international outreach center. The cautious isolationist at the beginning of the movie never would have opened up his outlook like this without challengers like Nakia and Killmonger. And the kid he focuses on here is played by Alex Hibbert from Moonlight, a child full of potential, an upward looking dreamer just like T'Challa's cousin once was. Who are you? Yeah, you know he wants to respond with a stark style, I am Black Panther. But he doesn't need to, because now this kid will have the chances that Killmonger never had as a kid. To reach up, as implied by Kendrick Lamar and SZA's credits music, all the stars are closer to the stars that blessed all of them with a history they can all now share in. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter for takes too hot for YouTube. Follow New Rock Stars and hit that subscribe button so you don't accidentally miss out on our next MCU breakdown like a dusted dope. You should have gone for the head.